Hey guys, welcome to a new video. First of all, I just wanted to thank you so much for 20K. I cannot believe that there are that many of you. I'm so, so grateful that you guys are subscribed and watch my videos. It's so fun to have you here and to create new patterns and tutorials and fun little side projects like this for you. I'm really, really just so overjoyed and grateful to have you guys here. So in celebration, I thought I'd do something a little different and a little fun. So here are 20 tips and tricks that I have for 20K. Some of these are super basic. So if you're an advanced knitter, you probably know all about it, but there might be something on here that you haven't heard of. So if you made a gauge swatch and you are not getting enough stitches in your gauge, you need to go down a needle size because your stitches are too big. So you need to make the stitches smaller so that you have more in four inches. Similarly, if you have too many stitches in your gauge, you need to go up a needle size because you're getting too many because your stitches are too small. So if you go up a needle size, your stitches will be bigger and you'll have less of them. Go down a needle size if you don't have enough stitches in your gauge and go up a needle size if you have too many. Tip number three, don't heat up your swatch to try and make it dry faster. Trust me. One time I was staying in an Airbnb and I made a swatch and I put it on the radiator. I don't have one at home, but I had one there and I thought, wow, that'll make it just dry so much faster. It dried so fast, but you know what the problem was? It shrunk my swatch and I didn't know that. I didn't know enough about swatching at the time to know that that would happen. So I made an entire sweater based off of the gauge of that shrunken dried swatch. And my sweater was massive because my gauge swatch was off. So it's something to be careful of when you're putting your swatch on a heater or you're drying it with a blow dryer or something like that. You just wanna be a little careful. It can change the size of your swatch. And then when you knit the real piece, it will be huge. I ended up having to throw that sweater in the dryer, which was dangerous because it could have felted the wool and it just ended up a really weird size. The body shrunk to close to what it was supposed to be, but the sleeves didn't. It was kind of a disaster. So learn from my mistake and don't heat up your swatch. Tip number four, different needle materials suit different fibers better. If you're using something really silky and slippery, your stitches might be sliding around on your needles. Now, if you're using metal needles, they're gonna slide around quite a bit. You could switch to something like plastic or bamboo and that will help prevent them sliding around. Alternatively, if your stitches are just not sliding well, like I know when I first started knitting and I bought those uncheap metal needles with the plastic cord for circular needles and my stitches like squeaked when I would try and slide them off those needles. It was very difficult and it made learning to knit kind of challenging, like way more challenging than it should be. And I upgraded to bamboo needles from Joann's and those slid a lot better. But even since then, I found a better metal needle. You might want to play around with different needle materials. Metal needles are really slippery when it comes to like cotton and silk, but are really nice for something like wool and acrylic. But if you like the stitches to slide, metal is a good bet. If you don't, try wooden ones or bamboo ones. Tip number five is one that I forget to do all the time. Take breaks and stretch. Your wrist will be grateful. Let me tell you from experience that a wrist injury is no joke and it can really hinder your knitting for a long time to come. If you're knitting for very long stretches, try and take a break every 15 minutes or 20 minutes. It doesn't have to be for very long. Just, you know, stretch, stretch your arm out, put your hands together like this. You know, I might do a video on that at some point, but you can look up tons of wrist stretches. Just do like a minute of that. But it's very important to give your wrist a break, take breaks and stretch. Stretching is so important. And strengthening your wrists and your arms is also very important. As an add-on to that, once or twice a week, if you could just do some light arm exercises, it can really help strength of your wrists and how pain-free they can be. Tip number six is that your tension can change with your mood. Your tension is how kind of tightly you pull the yarn while you're knitting. So you can end up with tighter stitches or looser stitches. And this is important because if you're knitting on one project and you're doing it in different scenarios, some that are calm and peaceful and some that are stressful, you could end up with some tension differences. So if you're knitting one sleeve in a calm environment and then you knit the next sleeve of a sweater on the subway in a high stress environment with lots of noise, they could end up being different sizes in the end because you're pulling the yarn slightly tighter in the more stressful situation. Or maybe you're used to knitting in stressful situations. So when you knit without that, 
you end up with a much bigger project than you meant to. It's not really something to worry much about. It's just something to kind of keep in mind. If you have like a reoccurring stressful situation, maybe have one project that you use for that and another for relaxing at home at night. Tip number seven is to keep track of your measurements. I suggest keeping a, a note on your phone or in a notebook that you use often. That way you don't have to re-measure yourself every time you go to knit a garment. You can just go back and refer to those core measurements on your phone. For me, I have a fitness app that I use and it lets me input all of my measurements. I've used it a ton actually when I'm referencing like how, how large is my upper arm when I'm going to pick a size for my sweater. So it's been very, very helpful to have that just on my phone. Tip number eight is to keep a crochet hook handy. I don't crochet anymore and you might not crochet either, but these come in handy so often for picking up stitches, fixing mistakes. They're just really nice to have on hand in specific situations. Sometimes I'll drop a stitch and I need to prevent it from dropping even further. I could just hook it and fix it right then and there because I have a crochet hook on hand. Tip number nine is to not be afraid of fudging your work. I know, especially when following a pattern, you wanna do it how it's written, but sometimes it just works out better to fudge it. When I was a newer knitter, I thought I had to do everything exactly like what the pattern says. Yeah, you know, it says to knit for two and a half inches, but mine is, you know, mine's in between two and a quarter and two and a half. And I would like worry about it. And what I mean by fudging is that you don't have to always do everything by the pattern or by the book. You can change things around as it works better for you. There are plenty of times where I've worked on a pattern and realized like a row or two in that I have one extra stitch than I needed to. And if it didn't throw off the stitch pattern, I would just decrease it and not rip back. It just saves you in the end if it's something that you won't notice in the end result and it doesn't throw off a stitch pattern, that kind of stuff can totally be fudged and it won't matter. So I might have to do a whole video on this one, but for tip number 10, when knitting a pattern with multiple sizes, if you like the fabric of your swatch, you can pick a different size option to get your desired size. If you knit a swatch according to the pattern and you match gauge, but you're like, I don't like the fabric of this. It's too rigid. It doesn't drape as well as I like. And then you knit a swatch with a size larger needle and you love the way that fabric feels so much more, but the gauge is different than the pattern. You can most likely use your gauge. I'll give you the one minute rundown of this, but I'll, I'll do a more in-depth video. So here's just a basic example. So the gauge in your pattern says 20 stitches per four inches or 10 centimeters but you're getting 24 stitches per four inches, but you really like your gauge instead of the patterns. You like the way the fabric feels. It feels too stiff with a patterns gauge. So you can most likely use your gauge. So let's say really general, if I'm looking at a sweater, I will look at the stitch count for the body. So if it's a raglan, don't look at the neckline or anything. Just look at what is the body stitch count. After you separate for the sleeves and everything, find that. And if you're knitting flat, you'll want to find the stitch count of the front and the back to get your, you know, total circumference. Anyway, let's say after just general, these are made up figures, but let's say after you separate for the sleeves of a sweater, the options are 100 stitches, 120, 130, 140. The pattern's gauge is 20 stitches per four inches, which is five stitches per one inch. And your gauge is 24 stitches per four inches but six stitches per one inch. We're gonna look at the one inch one. So five stitches per inch with the pattern, six stitches per inch with yours. So we take 100 divided by five and then also divide it by six and we compare. 100 divided by five is 20 inches. Divided by six is 16.75 inches. Wildly different. So let's say that you want it to be 20 inches. Okay, you wanted to knit that first size. That first size gives you 20 inches. That's what you want. Obviously, if you use your gauge, you're gonna get 16 and three quarter inch, right? It's not what you want. Let's go up the next size, which is 120. 120 divided by six, which is your gauge, gives you 20 inches around. So you know that with your gauge, and you knit, if you knit size two with 120 stitch count, you're going to get the size that you would have gotten if you were on gauge. I hope that makes sense. I can do a more in-depth video, but that's just like a really, really basic version. Tip number 11 is to push yourself to try new projects that you otherwise would avoid. Have you ever wanted to knit socks or knit a top-down sweater or something that just seems so far out of your skill level? I actually bet you could do it if you found the right pattern. This is just your little 
your little nudge to try something new. If you want to knit your first top-down sweater, I would suggest doing something basic, like a stockinette sweater. Try a raglan or a yoke and look up tutorials as you go. Find a pattern online that has lots of reviews. Ravelry will break it down by difficulty and on Etsy, you can just find lots of reviews. Or just ask someone who's very knowledgeable on the subject what they think, what their favorite easy patterns are. Same with socks, try a vanilla sock pattern. I bet there's tutorials online. I'll have mine up in a bit, but there are other tutorials on YouTube. I think that's the best way to learn how to knit socks. Tip number 12, if you're washing something made out of indie dyed yarn, the first few times you wash it, wash it separately from anything else. I soak mine with like wool wash, sometimes rinse it out if need be. But the first few times that I wash something made with indie dyed yarn, a lot of times the color bleeds. And there have been times where I almost washed something like this vibrant blue cowl that I made and I almost washed it with something that was cream. And in my head, I was like, I should probably not do that because the blue will most likely bleed a little bit the first couple times I wash it. It's not something that I would take the risk of washing it with something like light colored. Just wash it separately the first couple times to prevent any bleeding. Tip number 13 is that kids foam play mats are a great alternative to blocking mats. When I'm getting ready to wash and block a sweater, like the one I'm wearing, I will soak it, drain the water, squeeze out the excess water in a towel, and then I will pin it out on these mats. I got these for I think like $12 for nine of them, and they're about a foot each way, 12 inches. And you can find some cheap blocking mats, but in my experience, they're usually quite expensive, even if they have the guides on them. I don't find that very useful. I'm just gonna use a tape measure either way. These are the cheapest alternative that I've found. So instead of eight or nine blocks for like 20, 30 bucks, you can get that here. And I also found some that I was thinking of trying that are for like workout gear that are two feet wide. So you'd need less of them. I think it was like $20. I haven't tried those. I decided to go with these because I already had some and I lost some in a move. So I decided to get more so that they would all interlock together. Another tip, I suppose it goes with that in my very sophisticated bag here. So I do have a set of the Knitter's Pride knit blockers. That to me is the most efficient way of blocking. I love these. These are also very expensive. I think this is 30 or $35 for this little set. And this is not enough for me to block really much of anything other than maybe an accessory, which I don't usually pin. That's not enough for a whole sweater for me. I eventually will get a second one of these, but haven't gotten around to it because they're so pricey. So I just got these little like um, these T-pins from a hardware store. I think my dad just actually had these around. I don't know what they're from, but you can find them online at hardware stores. So I just have a plastic bag full of them. These T-pins take a little bit longer. They're not as efficient, but they work great. And they're super cheap, like a box of like a hundred of them, I think was like two bucks, maybe. Tip number 14 is to always, always label your patterns with the size needle you used and your gauge. This is especially important if you're writing a pattern, but also equally as important if you're just following one. So if you've printed out a pattern, even if you used the same needle size and the same gauge as the pattern, write that as a note to yourself that you use the same thing. If you didn't, write down what's different because you might set it aside for a few months and you might swap out the needle from that project to another project in the meantime and forget. And then you go back to it and you're like, I can't finish this because I don't remember what I was using or what my gauge was or any kind of different thing that I had to use. Always a good idea to add a note. I've made that mistake many, many times. If you're like me and you use a lot of circular needles, you're gonna want a way to organize them because it's kind of a mess if you just have a big pile or a big bin full of them. So a few years ago, I made a cheap needle organizer with just a couple scraps of fabric that I sewed. And I'm not, you know, an expert seamstress, so it's not, it doesn't take much skill, just run a straight line. I liked that one a lot. I would probably still be using it if it didn't get lost in my move last year. Unfortunately, our landlord thought we were out of the house when we were not, and he pitched the remaining stuff that we hadn't moved yet. And my entire needle collection was in that. So I've slowly been getting it back. So this is what I have now because I don't have a working sewing machine at the moment. So I just have a binder 
And what I did is I just bought like a two or three inch binder and I bought zipper attachments. So you can probably find these really cheap in like uh, the school section, like especially right, you know, back to school. Every size needle has a pocket and it works really, really great. Super cheap. You can get the binders, like I said, on sale for like a couple bucks. And I was lazy and used Amazon, so it probably cost me about 15, 20 for the whole thing. I wrote in Sharpie on each envelope, like how many of each size I have. So if I'm missing a size, I know I have one. Where is it? And I can search for it. Another really great thing to have on hand is just a really cheap kitchen scale. I've had this one for many, many years. It was super cheap, it was like 10 bucks. I do sometimes use it for baking. Typically what I do is I will have a bowl and I will put the bowl on here, turn it on, tear it so it's set to zero, and then place my knitted item in it and it'll tell me how many grams. Let me look at my ball band and figure out how many yards per gram and it's like, you know, 400 yards per 100 grams. And I'm like, okay, I know that there's four yards per one gram because I just did the quick math there. And then my sweater weighs 200 grams, so I multiply that by four to get how much yardage I used. It's not always necessary, but there are circumstances where you're like, I need to know how much yarn something took, whether you're writing a pattern or you're test knitting, or you just want to put it in your notes on Ravelry. Like, it's very helpful to have. It's also good if you're playing yarn chicken because if I'm knitting a basic sweater, I'm done with all of my decreasing and I'm just knitting plain, I can measure how much yarn is left, knit a couple rows, figure out how many grams per row was used and then do the math. Like, do I have enough? I have, you know, 20 rows left and multiply that by how much it used per row. Do I have that much yarn left? It can be pretty helpful. Try new cast on and bind off methods. I didn't try anything new other than like the basic beginner cast on for many years but now i'm always doing either a long tail german twisted or tubular those are my favorites and different scenarios work better for different bind offs and cast ons i think this which is a tubular bind off looks so much more professional and just cleaner than if i had bound off in pattern and it's really not that difficult if you find the right tutorial but you can find a bunch of those here. But yeah, I just want to encourage you to try new things. Even if you're just knitting a swatch, it's fun to try. Tubular is my favorite for one by one rib. Stretchy bind offs are really helpful for like shawls. Even just going from a standard knit bind off to alternating knits and purls when you're working in a knit and purl pattern, it can look way neater and give it better stretch as well. Tip number 19 is something I say all the time. It will be etched on my gravestone make larger swatches. It's annoying. It's very tedious. You don't like to do it. I don't like to do it either, but it's very important. It helps you get just the most accurate read on your gauge. Now, if you're knitting something that size doesn't really matter, like a shawl, cowl, sometimes even a hat, that's fine. You don't have to do a swatch. But if you're knitting a sweater, and especially if you're putting a lot of time, effort, and money into it, save yourself some heartache and make a big swatch at least six inches by six inches, if not closer to eight by eight. This is a big swatch. This is an even bigger swatch. This is more like a 10 by 10, maybe even a 11 by 11. You don't have to make them this big. I got a little carried away. Also don't bind off. Place your stitches on scrap yarn instead, like this. This will prevent any like pulling or puckering around the bind off edge and give you just a little bit more of an accurate read. I do a pretty normal long tail cast on and I don't find that I have any issues with that. When you thread your stitches onto waist yarn, also add knots. I added eight knots onto this so that I know this was a US 8. I did like six of these in various different, it's all the same yarn but different needles. Some are knit in the round and some are knit flat. So tying the knots was super helpful because even if I put like a post-it note attached to it or something, it probably would have gotten lost. So this is the, the easiest way, I think, to keep track of that. But don't skimp on the size of your swatch. It's very important to getting an accurate read. You can always unravel it in the end if you need the yarn. And then tip number 20, our final tip, is that it's never too late to change how you knit or purl. If you wanna learn how to knit faster, knit more comfortably, move your hands a little bit less, you can try out other methods. I just recently changed how I purl after purling the same way for over 10 years. I used to purl, you can probably see it in my old tutorials, I used to purl in a very slow, 
cumbersome way. I'm a continental knitter. So I hold it in my left hand, the yarn in my left hand. And I would just like hold it separately, bring it over, pull through, start again. And it would take forever. And now I just like flick my finger and it purls for me pretty much. It makes knitting and purling so much faster. It makes rib where I switch from knit and purl so smooth and fast. And that was after a decade of purling one way. I knew it was cumbersome and I knew it was slow. And while it's not all about speed, it's actually way more comfortable for me this way. You don't have to. You can stick with whatever way you've been knitting or purling forever. If you aren't fully satisfied with the way that you're knitting or purling, you might want to try something different. Even within continental and English knitting, there's different techniques that people use. It's worth exploring something that might be more comfortable for you. But yeah, that is my 20 tips and tricks for 20K. Thank you guys so much for watching and thank you so much for subscribing. It's really fun to have you here. I have a blast making videos for you all and chatting, knitting and teaching and, and thank you to all of you for being here, all 20K of you, which is mind blowing. I can't fathom 20,000 people. Thank you. I'll see you guys in the next video.